listening and we start the talk. Okay, thank you. So hi everyone, welcome to the Industrial Parliament Seminar. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Kim Yu Chen. is a principal research scientist of the Trusted AI Group and PI of MIT IBM Watson Air Lab, the IBM Thomas Watson uh, Research Center. Is also the chief scientist of RPI IBM AI Research Collaboration Program. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering and computer science and master's degree in statistics from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 2016 under the supervision, supervision of Professor Al Hero. His recent research focus has been on adversarial machine learning and robustness of neural networks and more broadly making machine learning trustworthy. At IBM Research, he received the honor of IBM Master Inventor and several research accomplishment awards, including an IBM Master Inventor and IBM Corporate Technical Award in 2021. He received the ITPLE uh, Globcom 2010 Gold Best Paper Award and UAI 2022 Best Paper Runner-Up Award. And he's going to talk about a modern inspector towards holistic adversarial robustness for deep learning. Okay, yeah, thank you, Gala, for the uh, nice introduction and thanks for having me here. So today I'm going to share uh, the lessons and the vision I have uh, for working on making AI trustworthy, especially making uh, deep learning models robust. So let me start with uh, something um, interesting and anecdotes, right? Because I know it's a Friday afternoon, right? So uh, last year, uh, our IBM communications team actually reached out to me asking me, oh, you seem to be very productive in this space, right? So published papers and so on. So can you tell us like in language that the general uh, audience will be understood? Like, what are you doing in this space? Uh, so they go, they have a, like, a, like a two hour, uh, interview of me and wrote a very nice article. Um, uh, one funny thing is that they decided to put this title, The Man Who Challenges AI Every Day, but we, without me knowing, right? So when I see this thing online, I was a bit embarrassed at that time. But on the second thought, I, I start to agree. Uh, they actually made a pretty good job in summarizing what, what I'm doing in a very high level, right? So uh, we, I, I'm basically challenging uh, the utility and the trustworthiness of the AI technology we are using today. And this is just not me, right? So I'm actually in a, a bigger group called Trustworthy AI. So in our group, we look at the different uh, aspects of uh, making AI trustworthy, including fairness, explainability, robustness, privacy, and so on. So that's exactly what we do every day, right? To make sure uh, AI technology is not just useful, but also not harmful and not uh, bringing negative impacts to our society. So uh, with this in mind, right, so I would like to summarize my research vision into just three words, that is the AI model inspector. So what I'm going to uh, walk you through today is a presentation of how we uh, get there and what are the tools that are available right now uh, to build this vision of AI model inspector, which is uh, uh, it's actually, you know, can be branded as using AI to design a better AI, right? So in a way, we want to develop uh, some pipeline, automated pipeline that uh, proactively and continuously monitoring the risks and mistakes made by our AI systems. And we should able to detect those mistakes and fix those mistakes and, uh, uh, and have a better version of our AI system as the next iteration. And Eventually, we would like to create this uh, trustworthy AI ecosystem where, you know, we as researchers and those machine learning models, uh, we, we uh, kind of work together, right, to make sure AI's uh, uh, technology is being developed and implemented in a safe and responsible manner. Okay, so for those of you, I know the audience may come from a different background, right, but for those of you who work on AI development, Right, we will know there's actually an elephant in the room, right? That is uh, the gap between development and deployment. So when we develop uh, a design, a machine learning model, right? We always uh, uh, basically doing things in a greenhouse, right? Just like how we grow plants, right? So we assume the data we have are like, uh, like clean and, high, and curated and high quality. And there is no additional noise in the environment when we are training the, the model. So, but in reality, when we start to deploy the AI model in the wild or in the real, into the real world, 
we start to uh, face several challenges like a distribution shifts. For example, the data you have in the real world is different from the data you train your model on. Or uh, the worst, even worse, right, there could be some bad actors in the wild that try to break our system and compromise uh, our utility of our model. So these are like common, uh, common challenges that we face in, in real life. And this is why we really need uh, to ensure robustness in our AI model to make sure they can be useful uh, and, and, and reliable to use in the real world. So I'm, as I'm motivated, right? So we not only want our models to be robust, we also want to prevent uh, our model being attacked. And this is a, a growing concern in AI technology, right? So as uh, predicted by a recent report, right? So the, the Garner report is saying 30% of cyber attacks uh, by 2022 will actually involve data poisoning, model theft, or adversarial examples. So these are exactly the new type of uh, threats targeting uh, the fact that our technology is start to use AI as part of the equation, right? So because the fact that you are using AI as a part of the solution, what are the new attacks, right? What new threats emerging on the horizon that may uh, be an issue uh, to your system and to your business? Uh, interestingly, there is also an independent survey right, on 28 different organizations and 25 out of them actually acknowledge that they didn't know how to secure their AI system. So on one hand, industries are very excited to uh, implement and try AI technology, but on the other hand, they don't seem to have the full complete picture of understanding what are the negative consequences uh, if they don't get prepared. And not to mention, right, it's very important to cybersecurity and national security that um, there is no prevention of uh, letting these bad actors to use AI to gain their leverage, right? So we did see a lot of uh, disinformation attacks and with uh, a lot of uh, um, negative impacts, right? By from those uh, hackers using these uh, AI tools to generate like fake images, fake videos to, uh, to, to be harmful to our society. Okay, so why do we care so much about robustness and how is it different from a a regular perspective of uh, machine learning, right? So I would argue that uh, for robustness, especially adversarial robustness, we care about the worst case performance of a machine learning model instead of the average case. So for those of you who work on machine learning, right? You, normally we benchmark the performance of the model by evaluating the performance on a test data set, right? So if the accuracy is good, then we say, oh, this is a good model. So this is what, how we evaluate the performance in the average sense. But for adversarial robustness, we are actually interested in knowing how well our model can still perform in the worst case scenario, where, where this worst case is defined um, based on what are the attacker's assumptions, right? what, are the, what are the threat model you are facing and what, what is the best our model can perform under this threat. So this is a worst case scenario. Uh, but the high level idea is we really want to prevent uh, predictive, uh, prediction evasive manipulation on the service and models we deployed. And there are several reasons, and depending on which role you are, right, that this is a very important problem to, to, to look at. So if you are an end user, right, so you would like to really uh, make, you would really like to uh, make sure you are using some technology that you trust, right? So, uh, but in reality, right, whenever we show our AI technology will make stupid mistakes or they are not trustworthy, right, the, uh, the users will start to panic and refuse to use this new technology. So there are several examples in uh, both real uh, physical world and digital world uh, to show uh, how easy we can manipulate the decision of these uh, uh, machine learning, state-of-the-art machine learning models. So this is one example where we simply add some uh, seemingly harmful uh, stickers to a stop sign, but somehow the machine learning model looking at a stop sign will be misguided and, and think this uh, stop sign is the speed limit instead of a stop sign. So you can imagine if the, uh, the software is, is deployed on an autonomous driving system, then you would not stop, right? Because you think it is, it is not a stop sign. And we, we also have some examples showing, you know, we can design some special pattern that people can wear on their t-shirt, right? Such that uh, whoever wears that t-shirt is basically become invisible to a, a person detector, right? So you can imagine uh, how you can hide your activity or you know, um, indicate some uh, limitations of the autonomous driving system if a pedestrian is, is becoming in, invisible to an autonomous driving system. 
And similarly, there are some uh, demonstrations to show how easy you can fool Tesla's auto driving pilot system, right? By simply adding some stickers on the road and the stickers will be uh, em emphasized by the driving system and you will make the, drive, uh, the car to drive into the opposite lane. Right? And you can imagine what are the consequences that would, would, would be. And we also see some examples uh, like uh, uh, how this uh, uh, how how this disinformation right, can impact our society and also our economy right by you know uh, spreading fake news. And finally, right, we also see some good intentions of these uh, big techs right. They try to release or de de uh, deploy some AI technology right, uh, like in, in this case a chatbot right to. Uh, be more interactive and with human and auto and and and, and uh, bring automation to different industrial sectors. But on the other hand, if you don't do these things right, right, uh, very soon uh, this AI bot could be uh, through the interaction of these bad actors. Uh, this AI bot could be could be uh, could be turned into a racist and uh, and say a lot of embarrassing things. And the company has to take that service down because it's, it's, its behavior is becoming more and more un, un, inappropriate. So as a model developer, right? So to, uh, to, once we realize there could be so many issues and failure modes of the models, right? We will really uh, put a high bar on ourselves, right? Before, before we actually deliver uh, the solution, right? we would like to make sure we do some testing uh, to ensure uh, we have a, a complete understanding of the possible negative impacts that could happen in the solution we are going to deploy. And if you are a stake, a stake owner right, or like a, 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 a CEO of the company, right, you will really want to make sure uh, your AI technology uh, should be used in the right way right, instead of uh, embarrassing yourself and even bring a negative uh, impact on your revenue and reputation of your company. So I would argue this is adversarial robustness is something that everybody should know and should practice right? no matter uh, which role you are in, uh, in either consuming or developing the AI technology. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm going to start to uh, uh, have an introduction of the holistic view of adversarial robustness. So I would like to start with this AI cycle perspective. Right? So we can basically divide the AI life cycle into two phases, you know, training phase and deployment phase. So in the training phase, we start by collecting data and then we select which model to train on those data. So it could be a decision tree, it could be a neural network. So we, we, and then we train on those data and fully tune the model. And then we go to the deployment phase. So in the deployment phase, there are different modes of deployment uh, depending on how you deploy your, your model, right? So in the typical commercial setting, uh, people usually de de uh, develop the, deploy the model in the black box scenario, which means the users can use the technology through uh, some API codes, right? We are using some uh, cloud-based solutions, but we, we never know what is the technique behind the, the function we are using. And there are also some modes that is in the white box setting where the technology you are using is transparent, right? So for example, uh, if you are using some transformers from a hugging face repository, they not only provide the model architectures, they, they also provide the weights associated with the model architecture. So what you are using is transparent to the user. So with this life cycle in mind, right, we can start to look at different adversarial attack categories, depending on the assumption of where your system could possibly be compromised. So for example, if you assume the attacker has the ability to poison your training data, which could happen uh, if you are collecting data from the open world, right? Like collecting data from uh, all articles online or you know, all images that you can find on Google, right? Then you have the risk of uh, uh, using some of the poisonous data in your, in your training. So in this case, uh, this, uh, this, this corresponding to training phase attack, right? Where attackers can um, inject some uh, particularly designed data into your training set and, uh, and it, uh, affect the performance and uh, even gain control of your performance, uh, gain control over your model. So we will have some examples like that in later slides. And the other case, it will be the evasion attack where we assume attacker has no knowledge of your training data, but the attacker can have some access to the deployment, the deploy model, right? So for example, it iteratively 
uh, using uh, your model that you deploy and try to generate some examples that evade the detection of, of your model. So this adversarial t-shirt will be one of those examples. And of course, uh, adversarial robustness also includes more classical security issues uh, that are associated with AI models, right? So for example, we also care about the, the data privacy, uh, how easy to invert and do reverse engineering of the model to reveal the, tra the training data. Uh, and even how can we do proper auditing and governance of the AI model being used? Uh, so all these issues fall under uh, adversarial robustness. Uh, but in this talk, I will uh, focus on the, the first three roles that basically are the new type of attacks targeting uh, machine learning function itself rather than you know, the other aspects of the entire system. Okay, so uh, with this notion in mind, right? We, with these uh, three uh, stages in mind, we can start to think about how can we do ro a proper robustness inspection in these three stages, right? So on the left, I'm, I'm basically showing this uh, recurring uh, cycle of inspection. So between the stage of data collection and processing and model more, uh, training, what we can do is we can have some way to sanitize our data, right? By looking at the data and try to remove uh, some spurious or problematic data samples. And between the stage of model training and model deployment, right, we should really do a complete and comprehensive validation of our model's performance to make sure uh, when, when it is deployed, the model is reliable and robust to distributional shifts. And between the stage of model deployments, right? So if upper, upon deployment, we have we should continuously monitor the performance and status of the model. And once we realize the model is not as ideal as expected after deployment, right? We should really take down that model and redo the whole process of collecting new data and retrain the model to correct the wrongs. So that becomes a recurring life cycle for a robust robustness inspection. And in this talk, I will basically cover some challenges that uh, we, uh, the major challenges that we encounter in both model development and model deployment phases. Okay, so the topic of this uh, uh, talk will be AI model inspector. And it's actually, I, I would like to relate uh, this uh, uh, notion to something that is more familiar to uh, our daily lives that will be car maintenance. Right? So I would like to relate how we use uh, the AI model to how we use our cars. Right? So for cars, it's very common to the users that you know, it requires regular maintenance and, and we should drive our car to the maintenance shop regularly to inspect any issues and fix those issues right, to ensure safety and so on. Right? So uh, in my uh, vision, I would, I would uh, uh, basically advocate we should do the same thing for uh, AI models. Right? So it's not just like, oh, my model is deployed and done. I don't need to do anything about that. That's definitely wrong. So this AI model inspector ideally will have two stages. In the first stage, right, as an inspector, right, we are given a model from a user and we will run this model through a, a checklist of robustness uh, to uh, benchmark or quantify the level of robustness of this given model. And we can run several scanning tools to uh, make sure are there any uh, imminent threats in the model or not, right? So if some um, threats has been identified, then the ne next thing to do is to mitigate those threats and eventually return a clean and safe to, uh, safe to use AI model to the user. So the whole process is very similar to car maintenance, right? So we do some car inspection, we fix the issues we found, and then we return the user with a nice clean and safe car uh, to drive home. So that would be a uh, uh, AI model inspector versus the role of car maintenance. And I really like this idea that I even wrote an article to, to articulate uh, that I, I think we should really practice AI maintenance and there should be no difference of how we do car maintenance versus how we do AI maintenance. Although the latter concept is well uh, less practice and well known to the uh, uh, common practice right now. Okay, so with this in mind, I'm going to show a roadmap and also um, provide some vocabularies that I'm going to use uh, in this talk, right, to, to, to facilitate the, the, the following points. So the first uh, thing I, I would argue to achieve holistic adversarial robustness for our AI technology, there are actually three very essential factors. The first one is that ideally we would like to have the solution to make AI robust. It's to be model agnostic, right? So you, you would really hope 
your solution applies to different types of machine learning model, not just one of them. Uh, but on the other hand, we also want our solution to be data specific uh, do or domain specific. That means uh, we, we should uh, maximally leverage the domain knowledge from the environment or from the task that we are solving to improve robustness, right? So for example, uh, some physical rules or some uh, language grammars that we can use uh, in based on the context of the model, right, to improve the robustness and to do self-correction. And the third uh, dimension, which is also, is the, I would argue is very important, but often over overlooked is the practicality of the solution, right? So most of the time for people working on robustness, we focus a lot on improving robustness, but we tend to ignore or overlook the <laughs> the, uh, the uh, trade-off right, on the model utility. right. So it could be that I, I'm making our model very robust, but I have to sacrifice like 20% performance uh, of the original model. So in industrial standard, this will not be acceptable if your solution will sacrifice uh, the utility of the original model. So for people of, uh, that work on software engineering, there is also a similar concept called the penetration testing which is basically saying at different stages of the software development, we should have some proper testing and monitoring uh, of the, 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 the thing we are developing to ensure it is in the right and, and right status and it's actually reliable to, to deploy. So with this in mind, I'm going to formally uh, introduce uh, what I'm going to use some terminologies that are specific in our domain and what are the broader uh, concepts for general audience, right? So whenever we say attack in, in this context, we actually mean finding bugs, uh, not, not necessarily from a bad actor perspective, right? But from a white hacker or you know, model developer's point of view, right? Uh, after we uh, design the system, how can we find bugs and fix those bugs, bugs uh, in an active uh, a manner? So this means we need to do a lot of sensitivity and reliability tests. Uh, by ourselves, right, to uh, do some pressure testing on the system that we designed. And whenever I say defense, most of the time uh, we, we can think about it as a, a general hardening strategy, right, to improve your system. That includes uh, the, the ability to detect um, uh, hidden risks and also the ability to mitigate those uh, risks upon detection. And ideally, right, those solutions should be uh, operated in a plug and play fashion which means uh, instead of you know, doing everything from scratch just to make it uh, robust or secure, we should try to see if we can add some patch to the existing system to improve its robustness. And when I say verification, I, I, I normally mean this model idea of a certificate, which means in some domains or some applications, we will really require, be required to generate uh, some attack proof guarantee of the system you are going to deliver. So for example, in some safety and reliability uh, critical applications like uh, some machine learning algorithms to uh, do autonomous driving or to do uh, air, like airplane flying, in those cases, we will really like want to make sure the uh, performance uh, and the risk of the, uh, the, the algorithm behind the control system can be fully certified and justified. And finally, there's a lot of things we can do, right? Upon understanding the robustness of the deep learning models, right? We can really leverage their properties to boost the model performance and develop new applications for AI. And I'm, I'm going to show some examples in this uh, today's talk. Okay, so uh, in the following slides, I'm going to show some research highlights uh, that relates to these four dimensions of robustness. So the first highlight is uh, finding failure modes, right? So although our end goal is to improve robustness of the machine learning system, but most of the time, our first step will be you know, starting with uh, uh, showing and demonstrating the current machine learning model is not robust or there could be failures. So this means we, uh, over, over the years, we develop a lot of tools to evaluate and, and generate these uh, prediction evasive examples to show as a proof of a concept that, uh, that these uh, systems are not ideal or not robust enough, uh, including uh, both white box and black box settings, and also you know, across different data modalities and different uh, machine learning models uh, developed for those modalities. So this is the uh, adversarial teacher I mentioned, right? So this is a real-time demonstration showing uh, in most of the frames, right? As long as uh, it's the person wearing the t-shirt is uh, close enough to the camera, then basically the person, the, the bounding box uh, detecting that person will disappear, 
which means uh, the person now becomes invis invisible to the machine detecting persons in the video. The, the second example is uh, this uh, image captioning systems. So on the top, I'm showing you an original image. And, and if we give that image to the captioning system, the captioning system will generate a description of a red stop sign sitting on the side of a road, which would, I would argue is very precise and impressive. Uh, however, if we add some very small perturbation, like so small that you are not able to see by human eyes, right, to the, this uh, the same, very same image, and then we give this image to the, the same caption system. Now the system will say a brown teddy bear laying on top of a bed. But in reality, there is no sign of a teddy bear or a bed in this image. So with this in mind, this is a typical example of an adversarial example, right? Basically shows um, it, the, the, the system seems to work to some extent, but they are also very fragile to some small changes in the input, right? which really questions uh, how, uh, how good are we right, in making reliable and robust machine learning system? And why and how can we uh, address this uh, inconsistency between human perception versus machines uh, perception? Uh, the final example I would like to show is uh, how this can be used by bad actors right, to evade the detection of uh, fake news. So I'm showing you a paragraph right, which, which will originally will be classified as a 100% fake, uh, but with some advanced technology using AI uh, by re rephrasing, reparaphrasing, and rewriting the, the paragraph with the minimum changes, right? like change guide, a man to guide, or you know, change the drive through to the correct spelling and so on. Uh, the, re, the modified paragraph, right? although the semantic meaning are preserved, uh, it, 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 will, it, 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 it will now be uh, classified as a 77% real by the same fake news detector, which means uh, your fake news detector, right, after uh, some machine learning algorithm is being implemented to modify the language, uh, it will now be able to evade the detection of uh, being a fake news. So this basically means uh, uh, is an example of uh, how the, these are bad actors right, could use these AI technology to gain their own leverages. So when we started to uh, work on this domain, we started with the question of uh, what if the attacker only had limited knowledge uh, of, about the system, right? can, our, can the system be robust or not? Right, so we start from the setting of the black box setting where an attacker right, can, has the ability to upload an image and observe the prediction of the target system. But the attacker would never know what is behind that system. Right? So it could be a decision tree, it could be a neural network and, and so on. So in this case, is it possible to generate adversarial examples uh, for this image? Uh, for, for, for this case. And, and in this setting, right, you can think about it as uh, some design problem where the attacker tries to find some perturbations to a given image uh, and, one, and, and desires the perturbed image to have a different prediction than the original image. So in this case, uh, this image will be a bagel image and uh, with some perturbations, it will be uh, classified as a grand piano rather than a bagel image. So this problem will be trivial in the white box setting, right? If the model is transparent to the attacker, the attacker can do something called back propagation to basically figure out uh, how do we add the noise to the, to the bagel image such that it will be classified as a grand piano. However, uh, in the black box setting, right? Such gradient information is uh, impossible to obtain because it is a black box. So our, our invention back then was to uh, uh, invent a way of uh, doing this uh, black box uh, attack, right? By estimating the gradients uh, from the black box system, right? So this gradient estimation can be as simple as uh, how we do slope calculation in, in calculus uh, to, and, and once we have this estimated gradient, we can use some gradient-like algorithms to find the right um, perturbation, right? To make the classification go wrong. So which means uh, the attacker uh, does not need to know the gradients. All the attacker needs to, to do is the input output response of the target system. And we can estimate a gradient and use that gradient to create these black box adversarial examples. So this, this seems to be a very simple idea, but it's, it's actually very practical and actually widely adopted in many of the IBM products, right? Because we can basically wrap anything as a black box function. So, and we don't need to care about whether the function itself runs on TensorFlow or PyTorch or different uh, machine learning platforms. 
everything can be wrapped yeah, as a black box function and, and, and call our uh, black box attack method to evaluate the robustness. So it's actually very, uh, very practical engineering solution. And for those of you who are interested in optimization, I know it's, it's a math seminar. So we also you know this, this research also opens the door to uh, zero order optimization, like function value based optimization as a, as a very novel application. And there are many follow up works try to improve the query efficiency and uh, even uh, finding adversarial attacks in a more strict setting. Um, so I'm going to show two applications right, based on you know, uh, uh, studying these adversarial perturbation ideas. The first example will be machine interpretability. Right? So that, let's say uh, for humans, right? let's say if you have many friends who has the same name, Steve, and you want to identify which Steve you are talking about, you will say, oh, I'm talking about a Steve who is a tall guy with long hair, but who does not wear glasses. So the feature of not wearing glasses is very important in a conversation to identify which Steve you are talking about. So can we adopt the same methodology right, to, to generate some explanations from machine learning's decision, right? That, that's the goal of the, this application. So let's say if we have a, a handwritten digit recognition uh, classifier and the classifier will say this handwritten digit is the three. And now you may ask him why, okay, can you tell me why do you think it is the three? So uh, we are going to generate a, some, a contrastive explanation by generating two sets of perturbations that are interpretable to uh, human. So the first uh, perturbation we are going to generate right, is actually highlighted in the cyan part. Right? So this cyan part are uh, uh, minimally sufficient to be present to support the prediction of a three. On the other hand, uh, the other perturbation, this uh, purple part is, is actually uh, uh, it's, it's actually necessarily absent right, to, to prevent the model giving a different prediction. So if the, this uh, purple part is being added to the same digit, you, the model will now predict this uh, perturbed digit as a five instead of a three. So our contrastive explanation basically works like saying this digit is being predicted as a three because the cyan part is uh, present. And also because the purple part is absent, right? Like similar to you know, a tall guy who does not wear glasses, right? So, and, and we are arguing this type of explanation is more direct uh, than this uh, correlation association based uh, explanation methods. Uh, the other application, which is, sim is seemingly co uncorrelated, right? Is the how do we do much, uh, molecule optimization, right? Let's say, if you want to uh, find a better uh, molecule, right, given a, a lead molecule, right, to increase the, the, the solubility or to decrease the toxicity of a given molecule sequence, right, how can we uh, actually use this uh, zero order optimization, uh, this uh, black box optimization in an end to end fashion to find a better molecule? So the idea is very similar to attacks, right? So we first, you know, embed this uh, sequence into some uh, continuous space and then we can apply some black box property predictors on the decoded sequence. And then we can search the space uh, in order to find a better sequence that satisfies multiple design constraints. So those applications seems to be irrelevant to robustness, but it's actually the high, in the high level, uh, the, the, uh, the, the technology that we are using is exactly very similar. Uh, it's just like we can apply to different domains by understanding that the models can be uh, quite vulnerable to perturbations. Uh, the second highlight uh, I would like to emphasize and which could be shocking to some of the audience is uh, the trade-off between accuracy and robustness. So uh, one, you know, a very well-known example that we did back in 2018 is that we take 18 different ImageNet models. So ImageNet is the gold standard uh, benchmark for image classification tasks over the years. So we take 18 uh, different models developed over time, and then we rank their performance by uh, the X axis, which is the, the top one accuracy. The, the, the better one means uh, having a higher accuracy on the ImageNet competition. So the interesting thing is on the Y axis, we also rank uh, their robustness in terms of how easy it is to add noise to uh, change the prediction of each model. So to our surprise is uh, the models who are, is actually having a higher accuracy at the same time is also more sensitive to input perturbations. So this is a very concerning trend, right? That which basically means uh, uh, when we think our model is better by having higher standard accuracy on the test set, it does not necessarily imply 
those models also have a better robustness. Uh, but this trade-off can actually be mitigated or uh, uh, or addressed, right? If we uh, develop something that is uh, aware of the robustness design constraints, right? So I'm not saying this problem can cannot be solved. I'm just saying if we are using the standard accuracy as the only metric to compare the performance of the model, we may be making uh, incorrect conclusions, and we are not even making the right progress if we want to make our model useful in the long run. So with this uh, uh, evaluation in mind, right, over the years, we try to expand our toolkit right, to enable uh, robustness evaluation of different models. Right? So in addition to these adversarial perturbations, we can also evaluate different types of robustness with different uh, uh, perturbations. Right? Uh, uh, examples like uh, common corruptions, like distribution shifts or semantic changes, or even evaluating the robustness uh, on, on the out of domain samples, which means on the samples that were different from the, the samples you, you, your model is trained on. So in one of our papers, we actually collected a wide range of data sets on this image net uh, task, right? So they evaluate different aspects of robustness to different perturbations. Uh, and we can, we can use this tool, right, to compare uh, different models, right? So for example, there is a recent model called the Vision Transformers. So it's, a, it's basically a transformer model that, that was originally proposed for a natural language processing test. And it was recently adapted to solve computer vision tasks uh, with very good uh, performance. So uh, we can now evaluate not just accuracy, but also uh, different aspects of robustness right, by comparing vision transformer with uh, uh, BIT, right, which is a state of the art convolutional neural networks. So uh, on most of the data sets and benchmarks, we do see uh, vision transformer actually pre performs way better than convolutional neural networks, which means uh, the choice of architecture really matters if you want your model to be robust and accurate. And um, we are going to uh, give a more complete uh, uh, analysis and a tutorial at the new RIPS if you are interested in, in this topic. And I believe all the videos will be made online. Okay, so. Uh, for uh, so we can also do the same thing right when we have developed more and more models over time right so this is a plot of our recent paper comparing the clean accuracy and robust accuracy right? robust accuracy means the accuracy of the model against some uh, attacks in in the, in the wild um, so what we can observe is that those uh, transformers right, is actually on the better end, right, on, on the right top corner. On the other hand, the convolutional neural networks is, 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 is mostly on the lower end, which means they are not, they are, their trade-off is worse. Um, however, if you look at the more recent uh, neural networks, right, like a MLP mixer, right, which is some convolutional neural networks inspired from the design of transformer, then you kind of get the best of these two worlds, right? You can improve the robustness of your model without sacrificing the clean accuracy uh, of the convolutional neural network. So, uh, so what we are really advocating is whenever uh, we are developing and designing new networks, right? You should try to put your model uh, in some spot of this uh, picture to understand how good uh, your model is in terms of both robustness and accuracy trade-off. Okay. So the third uh, research highlight I would like to um, mention is uh, how do we do detection and mitigation of the threats, right? So I already mentioned ideal case would be you know, detecting and, mi and mitigating those threats on the fly, right? Given any neural network, I should be able to uh, do an efficient mitigation with limited data uh, to make it practical. So one example I would like to highlight is it is a backdoor attack. So it is one type of the training phase attack where the attackers basically inject some, um, some signals. In this case, a spatial trigger pattern like this a white square on the right end bottom to some subset of the images you have. And every image that is uh, being injected with this uh, trigger will be also associate the, the, their labels to be digit four instead of the true label. So for any neural network right, or any machine learning model trained on this poisoned data set, right, because of the memorization effect of the model, the model will become a backdoor model in the sense that um, at, the, at the inference phase, right? So if you give any input with this trigger pattern, 
the model will think it is a digit four instead of the actual digit content, right? Because the model will think uh, the pattern that you inserted is some very important feature to uh, be associated with label four. On the other hand, it is a backdoor model because without this trigger pattern, the model just, just behave like a regular model, right? So without, without, without noticing uh, this uh, trigger pattern, you would never know the model is actually, it actually has some backdoor. And this really creates a lot of concerns, right? which means this is very similar to backdoor attack in the computer system, right? So the model will only lose control uh, if the attacker activates the backdoor in the system. And in, in the regular times, the, the backdoor is just inactivated and nobody will know. So this problem can, uh, can be of, of even a bigger concern if we think about more emerging machine learning settings like federated learning or distributed learning where each uh, client, or in this case, bank or hospital has some private data and they, they want to exchange some limited knowledge of the data, their private data to, to jointly train a bigger machine learning model. So in this case, it is called a federated learning setting. However, a backdoor attack can actually be a bigger problem here because uh, of the privacy constraints, right? If the attacker can control a subset of the uh, clients in federated learning, the attacker can actually distribute the trigger into different patches and, and, and uh, better hide the backdoor effect of the model and successfully uh, embed the backdoor to the federated learning model. So, and, and, and we even run some evaluations on some robust federated learning protocols and those protocols is not effective against this type of advanced uh, backdoor attack. So why do we care so much about backdoor attack, right? So let me motivate you with the practical examples, right? So let's say I have an amazing image net model, right? Which already achieves 95% accuracy and I'm going to release it to the public, right? Just how uh, people release uh, a lot of new applications nowadays, right? Do you want to use it, right? So without a second thought, you, you would probably say, yeah, yes, the 95% accuracy is the best model I've ever seen, right? I would like to use it for my own task or for my own system. But if you have uh, some, um, some uh, idea of, of uh, robustness or security in mind, right, you will be concerned right, if the model is released by some third, and third party or some, uh, some untrusted uh, sources. Right? So how do we know or how can we ensure uh, the model is sanitized right, before uh, we are using that, that model? So this goes back to the AI model inspector idea where we should detect uh, whether the model has backdoor or not. And if yes, we should uh, wash away the backdoor by mitigating the, the backdoor effect. So uh, one way to do that is a, a paper that we, that we propose uh, to do this uh, data limited or data free detection. So it's basically uh, a very efficient way of detecting whether a given model has uh, some backdoor pattern or, or not. So once the model is detected having backdoors, the next thing is we can use another method uh, uh, to, to, to return a, a, a better and clean version of the model to the user. So there are some technical um, um, details behind those two papers that I'm not going to talk about in, 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 this, uh, in this talk. Okay, so I can take a pause here and, and take any, uh, like maybe one short question if there's any. Um, yes, yeah, so First of all, I want to let everyone know you can type your questions in the questions and answer box. There is one question, but it, it actually came right uh, when you started your third part, but I think mm -hmm. the second part, mm -hmm. uh, how to measure the robust accuracy. Okay, yeah, so this is a great question and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in this highlight as well. But in general, there are two ways to measure a robust accuracy. The first way is what we call empirical robustness, which basically means you you use uh, you simulate the best possible attack at the current time, and then you check how your model's accuracy is against this uh, best possible attack at the current time. So this is empirical robustness, and it actually very flows very nicely to to the, what I'm going to talk about here. So the other branch is what people call the certified robustness. So can you provide some guarantee? And this is related to the verification that I talk about. Can you provide some guarantee in terms of uh, some proof that uh, you, can, you can guarantee no attack can be successful, right? Uh, uh, upon a certain range, right? So this is a, called a certified robustness because you have some guarantee that attacker will never be successful. 
So you can already imagine this certified robustness can be really handy, right? Because you know, uh, if we can certify the attack performance and be attack free, right? And then we don't need to worry about you know future and more advanced attacks, right? If we can pr prove uh, the system will not be broken. So there are several ways that try to establish this notion, right? So one way is to if how do you provide with uh, some scores to quantify the improvements of the robustness. And this could come very handy, right? If you want to do something on your model or right, like your training algorithm or your uh, architecture to improve the, the model's uh, robustness. So you would like to have some unified metric to compare what you do before and after. But if you see the score increase, that means uh, you have, uh, you, you indeed are doing something to improve robustness. So this is one score that we propose is called a clever score that try to uh, give a benchmark score uh, to evaluate the robustness. And uh, in more generally, this verification scheme so is very tied to the neural network architecture. Right? So whenever uh, there are new architectures being developed in deep learning, right, we would need a, a, a efficient verifier to provide some certified guarantee. So what do we mean by certified guarantee in more details? Right? I, I will go uh, very rough because I know it may be too deep for some of the audience. So in a high level, right? So we geometrically, we can think about a data sample at some point in the representation space. So what we are trying to certify uh, is actually uh, by asking what does adversarial example mean in this geometrical setting, right? So adversarial example basically mean uh, if we are given a, a model, that means these uh, dash lines are the decision boundaries of the model, right? So any point like laying on this uh, region will be classified as ostrich. So what adversarial example really means is some samples that are very close to this ostrich image, but they actually lie on the other side of the decision boundary. So any point here will be classified as a shoe shop instead of uh, ostrich. That's why it is, but if they are very close, that's why they look alike. So certified robustness in this case basically means, can we quantify a region such that we can ensure no matter how you perturb this point, as long as the perturbed sample still lies in the same region, right? like this uh, green region, for example, then you can guarantee the model prediction will not change uh, upon certain range of perturbation, like, like, like uh, with the perturbation inside this uh, green ball. So that, that's how we actually certify, uh, provide certified guarantees in this case, right? So examples will like uh, will be like oh i can now given this image i can certify you that no matter how you rotate this image right, up to like 30 degrees uh, the model prediction will not change so you will know any uh, rotation attack right uh, as long as the rotation range is within 30 degrees uh, the model will not change its prediction which means it's robust or a, a, a rotation attack free so that's uh, exactly the same notion we are trying to establish here as a certificate and you can extend this idea to different types of uh, thread models and perturbations. Uh, it could be input perturbations, it could be some semantic perturbations like a uh, uh, change of color or you know, rotation of the images and so on. And this is very critical for AI regulation and standardization right? because uh, at the end, right, most likely when we are going to deploy an um, AI system with uh, some necessary certificates, we would like to have a way to verify they are actually doing things correctly. So you would say, okay, I want a safe system to be robust to some type of perturbations. And are you able to certify the model uh, passes? Can, can you generate some certificate to ensure the model has this ability? So this is where the uh, verification tools come in uh, and, and, and can, can verify whether the model is robust up, up to these epsilon perturbations or not. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip the technical details, but uh, this uh, certification and scores can actually uh, be aligned with uh, humans uh, per, uh, choice of uh, robust models as well. So we have, a, we have some demos that basically sh uh, shows uh, how, how do we design the most, how do we select the most robust uh, deposit check uh, systems. Uh, and and you, you, can, you can show that the, the system that was selected by human to be most robust will actually always be the, the system having the highest clever score in this case. Okay, so my final research highlight, I would like to uh, present is a model reprogramming idea, which is something I'm very excited about. So this is about how can we uh, efficiently leverage existing uh, deep learning assets to do uh, some machine learning uh, tasks in some low resource regimes. By low resource, I mean, 
either computation or limited or data limited. So this is, can be think of a new way of doing transfer learning between domains and it can actually uh, be a very powerful setting, right? So examples will like, uh, we have uh, some uh, machine learning models developed for recognizing general images. And we have a way to repurpose those models to do um, biomedical image classification where in these domains, those data are, are, are very scarce and also the getting new annotations are very expensive. Uh, we also show some examples like we can reprogram a speech model to do time series classifications like industrial sensor data, for example. And we can even reprogram an English language model to learn the language of molecules, right? Like those uh, chemical strings and so on. So um, I'm, I'm going to probably skip this slide because it could be too technical, but I would like to show some high level uh, ideas of why this model reprogramming work, right? So given a pre-trained model from uh, some source domains, so especially those data rich domains like speech, language and computer vision, well, what we are doing is we insert some modules before and after uh, the pre-trained model to be able to adapt the pre-trained model to a new domain that is usually resource limited, like a time series, like molecules, like a biomedical measurements. So you can, and, and this is a very efficient way of reusing those assets, right? So especially nowadays in, in AI, we talk about foundation models, right, which is actually a, a very large model trained on a very large scale data set with uh, hundreds or thousands of GPUs and taking a month to train a good model, right? So once we have this a powerful model, right, for one specific domain, like a language, for example, how can we maximally leverage that model, right, to repurpose it to solve problems in different domains? That's uh, exactly what this reprogramming uh, is uh, focusing on. And I actually have a, a, a paper on, on this regard to introduce this uh, exciting technology. Uh, you can feel free to check out online. Okay, so you know, over the years, I, I, I'm working on adversarial robustness, and I think it's very blessed that it, it is a, a very unique domain that is actually not only of interest to the general users and audience, but also of interest to both industry and academia. So, you know, whenever we show the model it can be robust or cannot be robust, right, we get a lot of uh, news coverages and also awards from doing this research. And over the years, we also uh, release uh, a lot of our research resources in terms of open source libraries to encourage the community to build robust technologies with us together. And we are, are delivering tutorials at different conferences, right, to make uh, the society and community aware of uh, uh, these issues and the solutions that we can come up with. So one particular example, and this really matches this open science idea is uh, the open source uh, library called Adversal Toolbox released by IBM. And it, 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 it comes along with other uh, toolboxes, uh, open, also open source uh, related to trustworthy AI, like uh, fairness and explainability. So this toolbox right, actually includes a lot of things I talk about, how do you generate these adversarial examples? How do you uh, mitigate these adversarial threats and how do you do verification and so on? And this, this uh, the, the very same tool is actually being actively used by DARPA to evaluate uh, the defenses or the performance of different models in other programs as well. Okay, so some takeaways from my talk. Uh, I hope uh, with this talk, I have convinced you that uh, uh, AI, uh, adversarial robustness uh, should really be a new standard uh, for uh, making AI trustworthy. Uh, however, robustness does not come for free, right? So we see a lot of uh, failure modes and um, negative cases, right? And uh, e existing in both digital and physical spaces. Um, and also, you know, depending on where you are in the AI lifecycle and what are the th threats you have in mind, uh, your AI, AI model is, could, could, could easy, be easily compromised if you don't pay attention to that. And uh, something that the kind of, uh, um, a, 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 it's a bit un, an, an intuitive is that the higher standard accuracy does not translate well to good robustness, right? So, so if you really want your model to be robust, uh, you, we really need to look into those uh, robustness metrics instead of relying on accuracy as a, as a very poor proxy. And also there is a, a, an avoidable arm race between you know, adversaries using AI versus you know, using AI to prevent adversaries. 
Um, also in this talk, I introduced this uh, framework of AI model inspector, which I, I hope I provide a holistic view of this uh, technique and what it can, what I envision it can do uh, to detect and mitigate uh, the risks that we are witnessing in AI systems. Um, and finally, I would hope you agree with my long-term vision that uh, we should make and standardize uh, this AI inspection pipeline and make it as easy and intuitive to use, just like uh, car models and car maintenance. Uh, with that, I will end my talk and open the floor for questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Tinko. It was really yeah. good talk. I really appreciate uh, you know brushing a lot of uh, small details under the rug and giving a very nice uh, big picture. Um, it was very interesting to me. Um, so if people have questions, you can type them in the questions and answer box. Um, in the meantime, let, let's go to the end of your second topic. There was kind of an interesting figure there. You mean the, the robustness accuracy trade-off? Yeah, exactly. Sure, let's go there. Yeah, yeah, you, you passed it. Yeah, 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 let me go back. Okay. Uh, actually, so there's one here, but I wanted actually, oh, this, so maybe end of third one, sorry. Oh, this one? Was, yeah, this one, okay. yeah. Um, so here actually, you know, if you look at the transformer, it, it's both accurate and, and robust. Uh, yeah. robust. And, and this is empirical uh, robustness, by the way? Or? Yeah, so th this is empirical robustness. So we are simulating the best uh, possible attack. It's actually called the auto attack. So it's a ensemble of uh, several state of the art attack as, as a suite to, to, to evaluate robustness. So we are basically comparing the robustness of uh, every model against the auto attack uh, in this setting. So, uh, but I, I have to say, this is not a fa very fair comparison in the sense that we are taking different checkpoints of those models available, right? Instead of training them uh, in a unified uh, environment. So those models could vary in terms of the, how many parameters you have and also what, how many data you train on those uh, the model, right? So for example, transformers could be pre-trained on an even larger data set, right? So they, it's possible that they have seen more data and therefore they are more robust. So it's, it's, that's also possible. Yeah, but I think even if you control that variance, right? If you, uh, you, you make the training data exactly the same, uh, we, we have some, some attributions and studies in the paper to show because of the use of self-attention, which is something very unique to transformer. It, it actually gives better robustness compared to convolutions. Interesting. Uh, and now if you go back to the figure you showed, you know, you showed before the yes. uh, uh, accuracy and robustness. Did you have transformer here too or? Uh, no, so this, this is like an earlier study. So back in 2018, I think okay. transformer just uh, get uh, published or, or even before yeah. the transformer yeah. got uh, published. Yeah, but in the in the same paper that we compare the robustness transformer, we actually have some uh, scores like a clever score, like we have some certified score. And you can also, sh you can also find that uh, transformers are also uh, more certifiably robust than uh, convolutional neural networks. So, this really means that I, I think this really explains why people are so excited about transformers. So uh, uh, it, it, it's not only the fact that transformers can adapt to different data modalities, right? like unify uh, region and language and speech and so on. It's also because they have some really nice properties that, uh, that we desire a machine learning model to have. I see, thank you. So if there is one question, let me share yes. with everyone. Uh, by Tian Kong Chen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great talk. One high level question. Given the robustness accuracy trade off and existing robustness benchmark like uh, auto attack, uh, robust bench, etc., what do you think will be the future direction of adversarial robustness or natural robustness problem? Yeah, so I, I think we are already seeing some paradigm shift in, in this domain. So at the beginning, people are, are really uh, really focusing on some simpler uh, adversarial attack models, right? Like we only allow to change some pixel values to some extent, right? Uh, but very soon, especially in recent years, right, we try to expand this analysis to make the, the attack more practical and you know realistic in the sense that we now consider 
uh, a wider range of uh, perturbations, right? Like those uh, semantic perturbations where you know you can you can possibly change the color or the shape of the object or the background, or you can rotate these images, right? So uh, we we are actually over the years, I, I see a very quick evolution of the definition of robustness, right? Beyond just uh, this uh, adversarial setting, right? and also. Recently, we, uh, as a community, we care a lot of, about this out of domain generalization. Right? So we would hope that the, a, a, a truly useful and robust model right, can, can not only uh, generalize well in the in domain data, which means you know, the data coming from the same distribution you train your model from. It should also be robust when your model has some distribution shift at the test time. Right? So imagine uh, in the ideal case, right, if I train autonomous driving data using just the daytime uh, images, right, and I would hope a, a good autonomous driving system will also perform well in, in nighttime, right, although it may not have seen uh, those uh, data at the nighttime during training. But, an, but the ideal and, and, and robust model should be able to quickly adapt uh, the, the daytime scenario to the nighttime scenario. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for sure. right uh, in time. So people who wants to follow up with um, Dr. Chen, I'm, I'm going to actually put in the chat box the link to the next Zoom session. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you can connect and talk to him in person about his experience and also about his work. Um, so, so do you need a break before you join this link? Uh, I, I, I'm fine with that, so we can continue, yeah. Uh, but do you want me to join now? Uh, yeah, you can join now. Yeah. Okay. I'll switch to the room. Okay, see you there. Okay, I think it's thank for you. the graduate students. Yeah, bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Gila. Thank you, Gerda. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I just sit on this thing. I don't know. Oh,